This is episode two of our long-term Geo Corolla ownership series. We're gonna be discussing how 6,000 miles behind the wheel of this thing has changed our opinion in some ways, how it's survived this Chicago winter, one of the coldest winters in recent memory, and of course, what is cost to own so far. We'll also be talking to James from Limit Plus One, where he's gonna be discussing how the aftermarket has continued to evolve, and of course, what problems have come up with this platform as they are the ones who are modifying it and dealing with all of you guys, the glorious customers. Now, first off, what about the car and sort of a general overview? This is a 2023 Circuit Edition. It is mechanically identical to a fully loaded traditional GR Corolla. It means it has the diffs, the technology package, the cold weather package as standard. The only real differences are largely cosmetic. It's got a carbon fiber roof, which is again, more a cosmetic piece than anything else some specific circuit seats, which are leather covered and some unique paint options. Now, from a modification perspective, we haven't done a whole lot yet. All of that is saved for our next video where we're gonna be throwing bigger brakes, dampers, tuning it, walking through how this car in the various stages can be better or worse, lap times the whole nine yards. But we have CP pads, which are from Counter Space Garage. They're their hybrid street track pad. It's got some camera bolts, had its apex wheels wrapped in Potenza race tires, which we took off for the winter. It's now in WS90 Blizzax. Snow tires, highly suggest you do snows on this thing. It does transform the winter driving experience for obvious reasons. And we have some mega chip mud flaps and they are actually tremendous despite their relatively small size and they look nowhere as questionable as the Rally Armor flaps, at least in my eyes. It also has an armrest and was wrapped by Chicago Auto Pros in this British racing green. Again, I wasn't super happy with the color options available, at least in 2023. This was originally a gray silver car. It's got a 22.9 miles per gallon. And honestly, other than a replacement bumper, and here's some footage of me rally crossing it in the snow up at Road America to show why, it's been a pretty solid car from a reliability perspective. A couple rattles, a couple squeaks, nothing terrible as of yet. Now, before we head for a drive, I think it's time for Mark to hit you with a message. Thanks, Jack. And before he goes off on a 20 minute tangent, how he's gonna modify his GR Corolla with $20,000 worth of capital to maybe be faster than me and my Civic Type R, I'm gonna tell you a quick story. Jack is the type of guy that will stomp around in steel toe boots and tell you, oh, nothing else fits. You know, so he's he's that type of guy. So I'm used to having him destroy my floor mats and carpets and cars. But in all seriousness, you look at a vehicle like the GR Corolla, which we've been told is one of the most modified cars given the amount of volume that they've sold. So people are really eager to have fun in cars like this. Vehicles like the Civic Type R or the SS1 LE Camaro and GT350s of the world, these cars that are going out of production in favor of hybridized sports cars or EVs now, I think people are buying these and they plan on keeping them. And it's one of those reasons why my personal cars, my old fleet, I've held on to. I'm taking more care of them. And I never thought about this when I was younger. Like, oh, if I ruin the carpet or if I ruined a door panel, I'm like, oh, I can get parts for that. And you start to realize that as these cars get older, you can't get parts as easily or you pay a premium for it. In the case of the floor mat situation, you know, clearly not everybody's driving a, a nice car around. Like, you know, a, a family vehicle, you're, you're going to get used to getting it dirty and you can live with it. A car like this you know you want to keep nice or you're even crawling on the floor to do work on the inside or going to hit the obd2 port to reflash it all the time so you know tux mats one of the reasons why we partnered with them is this stuff wasn't available when i was younger on cars that i really cared about and because you have full coverage even over some of the plastics you don't have to be so dainty getting in and out and if i brush my shoe against the side panel or you know you look at the carpets on these cars they're they're trash the the under carpet i mean it's so thin so just if you're putting a lot of miles on it and your foot's rubbing up against it you could put a hole in it i've, I've had that happen to me on older hondas so you know brand like Tux Mat really does offer this full coverage mat and their concept was to, to really protect the interior part of the car. You know, and I've said this before, I really like nice carpet, but at the same time, I don't want to destroy my carpet. And if you drive a car like a GR for real, like a car that you can drive all year round, you know, at least on the driver's side, you have that peace of mind. Or if you have kids that are, you know, spilling stuff or you have somebody that's non, it just doesn't care about the interior of the car. It's, uh, small price to pay compared to most of the other modifications like an exhaust is going to cost you $1,500. You know, tuning is going to cost you, you know, at least $1,000 and all the other things that people do to cars. 
it, it's one of those sh small pieces of insurance, even for resale value. If the interior looks nice, people are going to be like, okay, they took care of it. So check out Tux Matt's sites. They do not have mats for every single car at this point, but they're building a bigger library and they're a big supporter of us. And you know that's why we're involved in doing this. So thanks for watching this segment. We're gonna get into Jack. He's gonna tell you about some of the modification game and some of the things that have evolved with the GR platform and what he's gonna do to his car soon. So as promised, we're back at Limit Plus One for our second update video. Sadly, the track is not open. It's the beginning of March. It opens up in April, and that's yep. when we're gonna start modifying the car. And this poor bastard's gonna have to assemble everything. <laughs> uh, but in the meantime, I wanted to ask him, as you are the technical resource, Limit Plus yep. One is the technical resource yep. in this video, on where we're at with everything when it comes to reliability, the state of the aftermarket. When we first did this several months ago, yes, yeah, that was. Quite, Long, a few, yeah. quite a few months ago now that you say it, yeah. The aftermarket for the Corolla was in its infancy. Uh, very early on, yep. you guys just started tuning the car. The first sets of intakes came out. Yep. There wasn't really any suspension options for this thing yep. and limited cooling. So let's start with engine tuning and engine performance. Yep. Where are we at now? So engine performance really has kind of come the farthest, I would say, in the spectrum of, of the aftermarket for the car. Obviously, it's overall a good engine, I would like to say, for the size. It makes a ton of power. Um, so they've really kind of push the barrier on, on what we can do with that so far. So when you were here last, we could only bench flash these ECUs. We'd either have to have a customer ship them to us, or we'd have to do it directly at the ECU because of um, security interface modules that we couldn't get access to the ECU from the OBD port. Um, luckily, EcuTech has sorted that all out, and now we can do phone flashing, map switching, pretty much everything that we need to do. There's still small details that we're updating over time, but they're being very responsive about it. But it's really opened up a much broader range of what we can do and the accessibility to people with these cars because you know before you're shipping in your two thousand dollar ecu and you're putting insurance on it and just hoping that some ups guy doesn't throw it at a wall um <laughs> and that's that's really where we were at and that's kind of the scary part of you're down a car and if something happens it's a massive procedure to get these things reflashed with new ecus to toyota um it, it's a process so having the availability of phone flash now where we can easily and quickly get people tunes and data log with them and you know it, it helps a ton for it um, really outside of that people have also been pushing the engines a lot further so I, I know we talked about this a little bit but really on, on 93 and 91 we're right at that 300 horsepower range 93 we can get like 305 ish um, with e40 we can get up to that 320 ish and then we start to run into some problems with the stock engine Unfortunately, um, the weakest link on these is the valve springs. They will float the valves really bad when you get close to like, really above like 26, 27 pounds of boost up to like 325-ish horsepower, you'll start to float valves. Um, we can see it in the logs. Where do you see the bottom end sort of giving out on this car? Like in the 400 range? I would say probably... And this is to the wheels, by the way. Yeah, to the wheels. Let's make that clear, by the way. Um, I would say probably in the fours, mid fours, really it's all top end issues that we see. We see lifter, you know, lifters, valve springs, valves. That's really the only places that failures or issues have been documented. Um, but generally the bottom end gives out as a result of the top end. So while we're on that topic, I know we sort of addressed it in our, our, our original video mm -hmm. we did. Cooling is a problem with these cars. Yes. And uh, <laughs> you want to expand on that a little bit? Other than obviously, we know the, the rear clutch pack overheats yep. and the all-wheel drive turns off. And no, there isn't a solution as of today. Unfortunately, we're well, still in development. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a not an easy problem to resolve. There's been a lot of options out there. People with these cars know that. There's a lot of talk about it 24-7. A lot of people work. have tried and none of them really work. Um, so we'll get there, but it is happening. Um, as far as, you know, drivetrain cooling, oil temps, coolant temps, they're both a problem. The biggest issue really is just the thermal capacity of the engine, right? You know, it's not like you have an American V8 that can heat soak and has the capacity yeah, to- like eight to, and a half liters of e oil. Exactly, yeah. it's, it's a minimal amount of oil and not a whole lot of space that it's dispersing through. Um, so it doesn't really have time to cool. You can very quickly on track, overheat them oil wise. We've seen 280, we're basically igniting the oil at this point, I mean. <laughs> um, the other one is coolant. You know, we had some fun in the snow and ran around for a while and we're close to limiter and high RPM for really not that long, you know, three, four or five minutes of messing around and 
pretty quickly we could see coolant temps rise. Uh, we boiled over gingerman. I mean, we're, we're pushing the limits of the car, but luckily in the world of the aftermarket, there is solutions to these problems. New radiator, oil, oil cooler, cooler, and of course the intercoolers, yep. other things. Yep. Um, speaking of, you know, bolt-ons, I know you guys are coming far along with exhaust, but yep. the intakes as well, when we originally did this, we talked about the various aftermarket intakes. Yep. Later, it came out that there were some issues with check engine lights. Yes. From my understanding, now for all intakes, that has been resolved, correct? Yes, so it is the infamous, infamous P2C90 fault. Um, basically, what happens is that there's a crankcase pressure sensor that monitors the internal pressure of the crankcase. Um, the way that it was getting its reference signal, basically what would happen is it would, from the velocity and flow of the upgraded intake pipe, it would see a difference in crankcase pressure and not say that it is, there's something wrong, but it says something is weird. Uh, and that's really why it threw the fault code and put all these cars in the limp mode that you'd have to go back and forth and fight with. Um, luckily, we were able to resolve that issue by basically it does not connect with the, the actual crankcase anymore. It comes from the PCV line, so it can measure it in a different way, uh, but it's really resolved the problem completely. And is it a physical change to the intakes or is it purely on the tuning side? Uh, for the actual... Not having the check engine not light. Not having the check engine light, you can get rid of it with tuning as well. So if we don't do it with tuning, there's also a fix for the PCV hose that runs back down to the intake that you can actually replace that and it has a barb that comes off and goes to that sensor rather than going to crankcase. The other thing I want to talk to you about again comes up, yes. stock clutches. Yes. How do they hold power? Where do they start slipping? I know in the press car game, because these yep. things get abused, you know, Toyota on the side talking about replacing press uh, press car clutches at three or four thousand miles, but they're yes. getting beat on yes. power wise. Where do they start slipping? Um, we have really we're going to start to see them slip. We haven't really pushed our cars too much. We're in the process of doing the heads, you know, taking the cylinder heads off, doing everything like that to get to that four hundred plus mark. But the problem is we're also doing a clutch at the same time. So we realistically think these clutches won't hold much more than three hundred fifty foot pounds of torque reliably. Um, and obviously with generalized just abuse yeah. as they are stock, they're not gonna handle it. Um, again, kind of the same scenario, playing around in the snow with very quickly, it was a very strong clutch odor <laughs> from, <laughs> from very minimal use. It just does not like it. It doesn't like launching. It doesn't like any form of clutch kicking. It doesn't like any sort of clutch slippage. It's pretty much immediately gonna start overheating. Well, at the end of the day, and. I'm I get a lot of flack for this. I, I take the flack so you don't have yep. to. This is an economy car that they've unshit boxed and turned into sort of this affordable all wheel drive yes. hot hatchback. Yep. Um, rest, I mean, we've talked about some of the other issues, but how are these cars holding up in the snow? I mean, you have a factory car yep. about the same age as mine. Yep. How bad's corrosion, all that stuff? Um, overall, like the biggest corrosion point really is exhaust. It very quickly corrodes and gets pretty pretty nasty front to rear. Um, the muffler being the worst, that's rotting out fairly quick. I wouldn't say rotting through, but it definitely has serious surface rust. The coating is failing on it, um, and it's looking like a five-year-old exhauster rather than a six-month-old exhaust. This is a Midwest problem? Yes, yeah. this is not. You're not going to have this problem in Florida. In California. <laughs> yeah. um, but overall, honestly, the cars are holding up pretty good. I mean, we purposely didn't really wash our car for a little bit to see how well it's going to hold up because as we all know old Toyotas the frames rot out on them so let's see how their coatings have changed and grown over the years and honestly they hold up really well. The other thing I will talk about is uh, bumpers on these cars if you autocross this thing or snow cross yep. they are incredibly brittle thankfully they are ridiculously cheap. Yeah in the 200 ish dollar range I mean that's unbelievable really for a brand new car. I mean, obviously you have to paint it and yeah. uh, your friends at IND yep. and um, A&L, A &L, yep. which same company, uh, painted this thing. Yep. But, so basically a paint jobs, however much it's gonna cost at your local uh, dealer if you're out here in the Midwest. Yep. They were amazing to work with. I mean, you're under a thousand dollars for uh, yes. a replacement bumper, yep. which if yep. you're coming from like a Mustang or like a BMW, it is free, yes, essentially. Yes, more or less, yeah. I mean, the physical cost of the bumper is minimal compared to the paint. Yeah, you're going to be paying more for paint. Yeah, 100%. Um, but with that, I will be seeing you <laughs> yep. in a month or so to do the rest of this. And from there, we're going to work on walking this car through a series of modifications like we did for the GR86. We're also potentially humoring the idea of doing a high versus low build, yep. showing what you can do if you are willing to buy you know, MCS dampers, go with the SX brakes, expensive wheels, then also compare it to a more affordable, potentially more realistic modification yes. game. So thanks again, guys. Thank you.
that time, Mark. <laughs> Update video for GR Corolla. Let's start this off with a launch. Your favorite car? <laughs> you ask the forums. Because I miss a shift. <laughs> nice rally tires. So I wanted to do this drive in the snow, uh, and sadly, every single time it, it snowed, I didn't have my cameras ready, we were busy, but I did get to winter rally across this thing up the road America, and you got to drive this in a couple of rainy, really cold winter days. Yeah. I think this experience for the car has changed a lot of my opinions on its dynamics, and I said this in our last video, I said this after talking to some of the other journalists who spent a lot of time in this car, when Toyota launched this vehicle, they should not have done it at a, you know, 100-degree track in Utah. It should have been in the middle of winter on a frozen lake because that's where this car is best. It's best when the surface is loose, when the roads are bad, and you can yaw this thing out and sort of enjoy that faux rally car experience they're trying to, to push on you because I really appreciate the all-wheel drive system in those conditions. All my deficiencies of it not being able to rotate on the racetrack and some of its limit handling characteristics go out the window when you reduce the grip and it does oversteer under throttle and it does lift off oversteer and you can br you can turn it with the brakes. That element of the car and having an e-brake and being able to rip it and get it to rotate around on a snow course is incredibly enjoyable. I told you that I had a ton of fun driving this thing. Yeah, I think it was the most fun you ever had at this car. And yeah, and, and any GR Corolla for that matter, better than any track day experience. And I think that's the way I appreciate this car. I think in, in some ways on snow tires, even in this dry weather, it's more fun because the grip levels are low and you don't really care that some of its dynamics are compromised. It's just an enjoyable car. I mean, how do you feel about this thing now? Well, I it, I mean, I don't drive this car, uh, so I don't really have, I mean, I know what it's like. I've driven it enough, but what do you really think about, because the people that are buying this car, this has been the argument about Toyota as a brand. They've kind of just not had any cars that are Toyota built, manufactured, engineered, fun cars to drive. And now GR is here. Like GR is, um, do you think this is a good entry point for the GR brand, a real Toyota product? Or do you think that what, they, what should they do with this? What do you think GR means? And I think that becomes my debate, right? Type R for Honda means I can take it to the racetrack and beat the shit out of it. I don't need to do anything other than maybe break, break pads and break fluid. Well, N for Elantra means that as well. Yeah. I can go to the track. Clearly, we've demonstrated that this car out of the box, despite all of the marketing and the fact that they give you a NASA day and all that shit, is not that car. What it really is is this. To me, GR doesn't have a, a strong identity that, you know, is it M like a track car? Is it, you know, is it CO? It's, it's not that. But if you are looking for sort of that replacement to a WRX or an STI, and you want that compromised car, but that it does sort of all the fun things that people want in a daily, that's what this car does well. Yeah. So, I mean, getting over that, that, that identity piece of this, I think what it's trying to do is bring back the enthusiast car that is Toyota built, yes, um, which they desperately need. They have all, all this talent. Because the Supra is not a Toyota. Yeah, right? no, the eighty six yeah. is a BRV. It's a Supra. Right. So th this to me is re this is why I like this is because this is their first real attempt at trying to bring this back. Um, I don't think it's completely sorted out, but we're again we're desperate in the car culture to have a car like this for that person that does not have $80,000 for a fun car, right? Like you're trying to get people back into a manual experience, manual parking brake. There, yes, is it too safe? Yes, it's too safe for what it is, but that's because we have a lot of more driving experience. We've been through more cars now. But if I was going to turn back the clock as a first time driver getting into something fun that I could afford this, it delivers on every single level of a fun car to drive that I'm not going to kill myself in. You can drive in the winter and the rain and have a lot of fun. You have the stability. You can still modify it. There's going to be an aftermarket support that is unbelievably good for, for it. So it really does check those boxes as that enthusiast car 
despite it not being perfectly perfected out of the box from Toyota. I think one of the things that's helped my time in this car is actually doing our job in the wintertime where all it is is a bunch of fucking CUVs and EVs yeah. that are all the same. Right. You drive those cars that are largely soulless, you know, disposable products, and, you know, I, I respect that those are also the cars that real people buy. You come from one of those and you get into this, you're like, oh, man, this has got character. Yeah. It's got some level of personality. Um, and you take it out of the weird vacuum of our job where we get to compare it against all of its nearest and dearest rivals. If you just compare it to, like, a RAV4 or like a Ford Escape or something that probably the owners of this car are coming from and into this. Yeah. Like the YouTube videos you showed me, people were like, oh, man. Right. No, no. It's, I, it's, I fully agree. If that's your perspective, yeah. this thing's amazing. Yeah, and I think, you know, I, yeah, it's hard because... And I don't mean that in a, like a condescending way. I'm just being honest. I mean, if, if you're somebody that's in the audience that's on the younger side, that this is your first fun car and you have maxed out every financial ability to buy something like this... You know, it's about trying to reconnect with the fact that not everybody's driven all the cars that we have. You know, we've become spoiled with this. So, you know, I, I mean, I joke around about this a lot, dude. Imagine if this came out in like the mid to like 2005. We'd be like, oh my God, this is the best car we've ever driven because it is that incredible for what it is accomplishing. We're just so spoiled now that cars have gotten so much more capable that you look at this and you're like, eh but it is still really good at what it offers to do. Yeah. You know, now that Subaru has kind of nerfed itself down and got rid of the hardcore stuff, Type R is just, you know, a one-off. Unattainable. It, it, no, it's a one-off car, right? Yeah. Like, they don't, they don't, they make it when they want to make it. They throw it on one model, and then people, you know, to be fair to us, we, we also have said that it's so good that now people are, like, paying too much more money for it. This is attempting to, to fix that. Um, I don't know. I, I really, it's grown on me. I would never own a car like this personally I've outgrown it but that doesn't mean that it's not good yeah I uh, you know the thing I'm most forward to looking forward to and this will be our next video and we're going to talk to you know Thomas and James not Thomas and James sorry James from Limit Plus One not the front of us guys about is you know I feel like and the owners are the same way I mean a statistic I didn't talk about with James is if you look at their sales numbers, because they're the biggest part seller for this car, yeah. the number of individual customers they have, about half of the owners of GR Corollas, because you about 5,000 of these cars or something, have modified these things. I'm really curious to see how a really good set of dampers, how a good alignment, some suspension components, some engine tuning and cooling will turn this into a, or has the ability to turn this car into some like track day beast yeah. that you love to just pound the, the, the snot out of on a, on a road course. I think I think that'll get sorted out. You know, we're still in the early days of this car, even though it's been out for like a year. Probably by year five, if they stick with this drivetrain somehow, I think these things will be, you know, a staple. You know, it really will. I mean, they're the ultimate, you know, Midwest, non-friendly like weather friendly car to drive year around despite its interior not being you know the best usability the ride quality is worse than like the wrx yeah it's more claustrophobic than something like a wrx or a honda but there isn't a charm that comes it feels from japanese those, yes it does feel japanese and i and think the that's three cylinder right it, it does feel distinctly toyota even with all its like weird quirks about it I, I do appreciate that about that. I just want to see where they take this. I think that's the thing for me. You know, there's this constant discussion of what GR is going to be. I really hope that they evolve this out and do more with it than just like throwing shit against the wall. Like, oh, you know, we're going to do that this year. Hopefully it has more of an identity and it really creates, keeps this enthusiast mindset or enthusiast crowd together um, that there's more products like this coming down the pipe. Yeah.